In our last lesson, we discussed the concept of a high priest. God developed this concept under the ancient economy of law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God. In that concept, we found that a high priest is related to the people for whom he ministers before the presence of God. The high priesthood is also a work. It is not just a position. It deals with a function that is required by God. The high priest was appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices before God and to minister in the sanctuary. The sanctuary spoke of a place that people drew near to God in, a place where a greater cognizance of God could be realized and where the wrath of God could be subdued. The concept of a high priest. The character of God demands such a concept because of His intense love for mankind and His fervent desire to have men come back to Him. God has provided a high priest to minister before Him in behalf of men. In this lesson, we want to deal with the truth of the appointment of high priests. High priests are appointed. It is not an elective office. It is not an office staffed by volunteers. It is an office filled by divine appointment. Christ's high priesthood is directly associated with your salvation. We do want to make that clear throughout this series, that at no point are you to view Christ in separation from your personal salvation. Christ is, in fact, God's means of implementing the salvation of the human race. And in His role of high priest, He continues to implement that great salvation. Let's begin by refreshing your mind with a few of the key elements involved in the high priesthood. A high priest, according to Hebrews, the fifth chapter and verse one, was taken from among men. This was not an angelic office, not an office for high lofty spiritual beings, but one filled by a person who was taken from among men, a son of man, as well as a son of God. Again, Hebrews, the fifth chapter and verse one states that the high priest was appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices and to minister in things pertaining to God. The high priest was not primarily concerned with serving men, but serving God. Not with offering to men, but offering to God. The basis of his effective ministry to men was his effective ministry toward God. Hebrews, the fifth chapter and verse two adds a very relevant truth. Of high priest, it is said that they can have compassion on the ignorant. This indicates to us that God has a desire to have compassion upon those that are ignorant, those that are unaware of himself, those that are unaware of his great salvation, those that are unaware of the great benefits that he has provided for them that love him. God wants to have compassion upon them, not by overlooking their status, but by elevating them to a status of, igno of non-ignorance and insight and intelligence. God is not content for you to be unaware of what He has done and what He has prepared for you. Hebrews, the fifth chapter and verse three states that the high priest offered for people he made offering for sins, the sins of the people. Now this concept of a high priest taken from among men, ministering things pertaining to God, offering both gifts and sacrifices, having compassion on the ignorant and offering for sins, lifts the matter of salvation away from the menace of mediocrity and the tragedy of an unthinking concepts of religion and God. Right. Jesus Christ has brought intelligence to the matter of salvation. He has brought concepts to a lofty status where they can penetrate into the heart of man and make living relevant and enjoyable. Every aspect of salvation is planned and deliberate. None of it is happenstance. None of it is characterized by motives or ambitions that cannot be understood. Salvation was laid out in eternity upon the trestle boards of heaven, and it has been wrought out in the crucible of life according to deliberate, deliberate purpose 
end plan. Now you cannot participate in this great salvation called in Ephesians 3 and verse 11 an eternal purpose. You cannot participate in it by being casual and indifferent. Deliberation, purpose, and plan impregnate every aspect of salvation. And for you to participate in it, you too must become resolved and insightful and understanding of the great purpose of God. This salvation required a basis upon which a continual ministry could be executed. The high priesthood of Christ refers to a work that is required by both heaven and earth. Heaven required someone to work in behalf of man, and earth required someone in heaven to work in their behalf. So a high priest is required by both God and man. God requires him to bring the people to him, and the people require him to bring God to them. The high priesthood of Christ is a very relevant ministry without which we would be without hope and without God in this present world. You will notice in Hebrews 5 and verse 1 that it is said of a high priest that he is taken from among men for men. That is a key thought. For men. Divine provision for men is found in the great high priest. Our high priest nourishes or succors, as the scripture says, those that remain in this world. The high priesthood of Christ is heaven's view of your salvation. High priests were appointed. It was not an elective office, not an office staffed by volunteers. Now let's look for a moment at the appointments of God. God's appointments are never to be questioned. They are an aspect of his divine character. God is noted for his appointments, for his divine decrees, his divine fiats and mandates. Let's review a few of them to show that the appointed high priest is in keeping with the divine character. It is said in Isaiah, the 26th chapter, in verse 1, that God shall appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. That is to say, God shall appoint his great salvation as a means of protection an exemption from the wrath of our adversary, and freedom from bondage to sin and to iniquity. He shall appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Do you recall when God made that ancient promise to Abraham concerning the birth of Isaac, called by Paul the child of promise? In Genesis the 18th chapter in verse 14, God said, At the appointed time I will return and Sarah shall have a son. The appointed time, a divine mandate. Again in Exodus the ninth chapter in verse 5, in the midst of their working out of Israel's deliverance from 430 years of Egyptian bondage, it is said the Lord shall appoint a set time. At that time predetermined plagues were brought upon the unbelieving Pharaoh and his nation, and ultimately Israel was released. It is said they came out the self same day, and not a hoof was left behind. Divine appointments are woven throughout Scripture to teach us that God works by plan, works by purpose. He does not work in a reactionary manner. Again, in Daniel, the fifth chapter, in verse 21, King Nebuchadnezzar had to learn a lesson from God Almighty. He was driven out from among men. He lost his sanity and roved as a wild beast upon the hills. His hair grew long and his nails grew long. And it is said he remained in that state until he come to find that the Lord ruled among the kingdoms of men and appointed over them whomsoever he will. One of the great texts of Scripture that emphasize God's appointments are not primarily negative is found in 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, and verse 9. It is stated there that God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. That is to say, God's inclination is not to condemn men. God's purpose is not to damn men. God's purpose is to save them. Whoever is lost is lost because they ignored God's preference. The high priesthood of Christ emphasizes God's preference to save people, and is in keeping with the bent of his appointments, which is for man's benefit and favor. You will recall it is also said in Scripture, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. 
Hebrews 9, 27. Now there you find the great love and magnanimous favor of God. You are appointed to die only once, not twice. If you're born twice, you will die once. If you're born once, you will die twice, but not by divine appointment. The point here is that God's appointments are favorable. They are not against us, they are for us, and they are part of His character. And in keeping with the divine character, an high priest was appointed obviously, to obtain favor for the people. The appointments of God are not to be questioned. When we emphasize appointments, we're talking about divine choice. Now, the point in divine choice is not mere heartless choice. It is not that God determines without cause to do things. As He said through Ezekiel the prophet, In that day you shall know that I have done nothing that I have done without a cause. God's appointments and choices are deliberate. They're for a reason. There's a divine purpose that undergirds them. You see, the choice itself is not the focus, but the purpose for the choice. And the purpose for God's choice, particularly in the matter of our great high priest, is the salvation of mankind. Now, this puts heart again into religion. For you see, a cold theology does not glorify God. True theology, the true knowledge of God, is pulsated with life and vitality. For all of God's choices are for reasons and for divine purposes to do man good and not to do him evil. Now the appointment of a high priest was absolutely necessary. In this role of representing men before God, it was imperative that God's choice be there. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter and verse 4, the word of the Lord says, No man takes this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Aaron didn't volunteer for the assignment. God placed him there because it was God's purpose that was being served in this office. <clears throat> Jesus Christ was appointed high priest. And an interesting thing is said of him in Hebrews, the third chapter, in the first two verses. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. He was appointed because God was that serious. God was that intense in his longing to bring you to himself. Now the appointed high priest guarantees that there will be any approach to God at all. If there is no high priest, there will be no approach by men to God. But if there is a high priest appointed by God, it indicates to us that God wants us to come near. God wants us to approach. That's why He has ordained and appointed a high priest in this role. The appointment of a high priest determines whether there's going to be any mediation at all and whether the mediation is acceptable. God will accept whom He appoints. And when God appoints Jesus Christ our high priest, you may rest assured, He will receive His pleadings. He will receive His representation of mankind. If Jesus Christ loves you and represents you to God, make no mistake about it. God will receive him because he has appointed him, and Jesus has been faithful to the God that appointed him. The appointed high priest assures those for whom the mediation is made of their acceptance. Treasure that in your soul. And whatever you doubt, whatever you have questions about, let it not be whether or not you're accepted of God. Let it not be whether or not God has favor towards you. Let it not be whether or not God will receive you and bless you. He has appointed a high priest to secure the blessing for you, and all that remains for you to experience it is your willingness to receive it. God's appointments are not made because of a lack of trustworthiness in the person that's appointed. And one must not construe this. He appointed Jesus not because he did not depend on Jesus, so to speak, volunteering. Although from one perspective Jesus did volunteer, as it is said in Hebrews the 10th chapter, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. The emphasis on the appointment of God is that God has determined to do this. This is God's will. 
Now, student, I fear that in much religious activity, God has been exempted. Somehow, the great longing of the Father has been placed into the background. Jesus Christ is presented to us within the context of the will and desire and purpose of God. Without God's desire, there would have been no Christ, no Jesus, the Son of God. He is God's representative. And he is God's executor of his eternal purpose. You see, presumption is ungodlike. At no point is our salvation characterized by presumption. At no point can you look at salvation and wonder whether it applies to you or not, whether it pertains to you or not, whether God's made provision for you or not. God is the architect of salvation. And he has built into every warp and woof of it. Every aspect of salvation has the mark of God upon it. And God's desire. And God's will. Now the appointment of Jesus Christ is declared in Scripture. Pointedly. God wants you to know that he has appointed Jesus to do what he wanted done. He wanted your sins to be remitted, removed from his presence. He did not want to view you as a sinner. He wanted you to come to Him, live with Him, reign with Him. The high priesthood of Christ, therefore, was appointed, appointed by God. Hebrews, the fifth chapter and verse 5, says this, So also Christ glorified not Himself to be made an high priest, but He that said unto Him, Thou art My Son, today have I begotten Thee. Today My great plan began. Today, God is saying, my eternal purpose begins to, be, begins to be implemented. Jesus Christ, I have appointed you, my son, to bring the people back to me, to make full provision for their acceptance. This day have I begotten thee. Thou art my son. How often that is mentioned in Scripture. At least two times the heavens reverberated with the voice of God during Jesus' ministry. Once Jesus was baptized of his own cousin, John the Baptizer, in the River Jordan, the Scriptures record that as he rose up out of the water, that the heavens split and a voice fell from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. From that point on to today, no man dare question his acceptance in Christ Jesus. God is pleased with Jesus and consequently with all that are in him. Again, Jesus took his disciples up to a mountain to pray. It is recorded in Matthew, the 17th chapter. There as he began to pray and drew close to his father, the countenance of his face was altered and the skin of his face began to shine. The scripture says his garments became glistering white and he was transfigured there before him. The glory that was in his spirit burst out of his skin, so to speak, and somewhat of his marvelous character was revealed there in a physical, sensible way. Uh, the disciples then heard a voice following that that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased Hear him, not just Moses and Elijah that stood with him there in the holy mount and spake about the decease he should accomplish at Jerusalem. This is my son. This is the one I've appointed. This is my guarantee to the world that they'll be accepted by me if they will come through him. Jesus was devoted to the enterprise of salvation. That's why he was a beloved son. Jesus Christ was committed to fulfilling the will of God to bring people home. That's why God was well pleased in him. You will recall at this truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which was a declaration of the high priesthood of Christ, according to Hebrews 5.5, 5, that this forms the foundation of man's acceptance and relationship with God. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, and verse 16, it was Simon Peter that first said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus Christ said to him, You just didn't think this up yourself, Simon. You didn't learn this in the schools of men. The Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees did not teach you this, nor did the lawyers of old. My Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. And on this rock foundation, this perception of who I am, my Father has commissioned me to build my church, and the very gates of death shall not prevail against it. An appointed high priest, when accepted, makes heaven your guarantee. Make no mistake about it. The confession of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, which is a, once again the declaration of His high priesthood, forms a, an official recognizable acceptance of God. But a denial of Jesus as the Son constitutes a denial of the Father also. In 1 John, the second chapter, verses 22 through 24, this statement is made. Who is the liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoso denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Jesus Christ is connected to God. He cannot be separated from Him. Your acceptance or rejection of Christ constitutes your acceptance or rejection of God. Now this concept is integral to the idea of a high priest. The high priest is who you embrace, and by so embracing Him, you have embraced the God that appointed the high priest, and God desires to show mercy upon you. Your identity with the Son of God is what constitutes your victory over the world. Satan has designs to take you from God. God wants you to come near to Him, into the sanctuary, so to speak. Satan wants to thrust you out from the sanctuary. He knows that away from God, separate from God, you are without hope in the present world. How can you overcome the devil and his wily devices? How can you be guaranteed to be accepted by God. Here it is, 1 John 5 and verse 5, and a glorious truth it is. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now you must take that for what it's worth. You must not balk at it. It is imperative that you be honest before our God. If you are being overcome by the world, you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The scripture says the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. And the one that overcomes the world is the one that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That accepts His appointment by God to bring them to the Father. To see to it that they are not swallowed up by this present evil world. And are not consigned to the lake of fire which was not made for man but for the devil and his angels. God sent His Son on a mission, appointed Him to do a work for Him, and as high priest, He is implementing that mission to its completion. 1 John 4 and verse 9 says that God sent His Son into the world, His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. There's a high priestly ministry. Again in 1 John 4 and verse 10, speaking of His preparatory work for His high priestly ministry, it says that God sent the Son into the world to be a propitiation for our sins. At no point is Jesus associated with merely earthly objectives. His earthly ministry, His vicarious death, and His current high priestly ministry is for heavenly objectives. He is not primarily concerned with political, social, or domestic issues, but with eternal issues. He is targeting the time when heaven and earth shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the works that are in the earth shall be burned up and a new heavens and a new earth appear wherein dwells righteousness. His high priesthood is guaranteeing your acceptance at that time. 
I bid you to live in awareness of it. Our Lord Jesus is God's anointed one, His chosen one. He was not only chosen to die and to lay down His life an offering and sacrifice for many and a ransom for the world, but He was appointed to be a high priest to carry this work to its glorious completion. If Jesus is appointed, there is no other acceptable way, no way of self-developed works, no self-conceived system of achieving good will suffice not involvement with mere organized religion. You must become involved with the high priest. You must let his ministry cover your work. You must depend upon him representing you to the living God. In Christ you are guaranteed acceptance. You are guaranteed approval because he's appointed. High priests are appointed. Jesus did not take this honor upon himself. He is associated with a living God in implementing this great salvation. And when you're joined to Christ, you're joined to God also, which is another way of saying you are guaranteed His favor and guaranteed His acceptance. This is why unbelief is such a great sin. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit of God, when He has come, He will convince the world of sin, of sin, because they believe not on me. The ultimate transgression is the rejection of God's Christ, the Son of God. The ultimate rejection is a refusal to accept the current ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ as high priest. By so doing, an individual questions the integrity and the longings of his God. He refuses to believe that God has provided some better thing for us in Christ Jesus. Now there's no reason, student, for you to reject this. You cannot sound, cite a sound reason for doing so. So I bid you to lean upon the Lord, to seek to know your high priest, and daily to thank God for him.